there is no other. And so, Lord, we're here to lavish you with our praise. We're here to sit at your feet to learn from your words. We pray, Father, that you'll be honored by everything you see and hear in this room. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're glad you're here this morning. If you are visiting, super excited that you joined us today. Uh, if you do me a favor, if you are here for the first time, when the service is over, if you'd make your way to the front of the sound booth in the back of the room, you'll see a table there with some white bags on it. That's just information bags for you, so please grab one of those as you're heading out the door today. Uh, if everybody would take a moment right now while I'm speaking, grab your bulletin if you got it. Go to the back of that bulletin. I should hear paper everywhere, right? Tear that off. Tear that off in the back, that communication card. Fill it out in a little while. When we receive our offering, you can go ahead and place that in the basket at that time. All sorts of things you can fill out on there. Uh, so we want to make sure that you just take the opportunity to do that. I uh, want to make you aware of a couple of things. One, you probably have saw it in the bulletin last week. It is in there in a different form this week. So if you've got your bulletins handy, I want to draw your attention to the Single Moms Outreach. Uh, you are familiar that we have recently joined with Bridge Nuego. And this is kind of an offshoot uh, ministry that's happening uh, on the 8th. It is, a, it is really just designed to get single moms in our community together. 
you know, to, to try to build up some kind of a support network uh, to get them talking with one another, encourage one another. And so area churches are joining together at the Grant Area Library on the 8th from 5 to 7 uh, just to give these moms a chance to get together. So that requires some bodies to make that work, okay? So if that interests you, something you'd like to be a part of, uh, I want to make sure that you uh, have a contact information here. So if you've got your pens handy, write this number down. It's 847-767-3256. Uh, the person you're contacting, their name is Kathy. If you want to uh, text that or call that, what they're looking for, they need people who will, uh, who will help with making some cookies. They need people who will maybe help with serving dinner. They need people who will just hang out with the moms and talk with them. They need people who will help with the kids. All right, they're going to take the kids and let them do some fun things and maybe do a few games with the kids and stuff like that just so the moms can meet together and build those relationships. So that's coming up next weekend, so time is of the essence. If that is something that you are willing to participate in, hopefully you do. Uh, we want to be able to join forces with other churches. Please call Kathy at that number and let her know that you're going to do it. Now, having said that, again, time is of the essence, right? So if you are going to be working with kids and you have not gone through the child protection policy yet, we need to do that. So the sooner you can let us know that you're going to do that with kids, the better off we are so that we can get you all set up with that. Uh, second thing I want to make you aware of, uh, I can't remember if I mentioned it in side conversations and things, but really excited that our church is going to be pursuing purchasing a portable baptistry. And so I want to give you just a little bit of what that's going to look like, and then I'll tell you what's going to happen after that. We are really, really fired up about the opportunity to be able to celebrate people coming to Christ all year round. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, let me tell you a baptism story. Uh, years ago, I met a guy in the gym, and uh, he had just told me that he just recently given his life to the Lord. He had been struggling with alcoholism and all sorts of things, and he was really looking to get involved with a church, trying to, trying to find some spiritual grounding. And so he came to the church that I was at. So, you know, we'd talked there in the gym. And he wanted to go further. He wanted to learn. So we did some discipleship stuff together. And uh, he really felt convicted. You know, now as a new believer, I believe Scripture tells me to be baptized. So I want to be baptized. Can we just do a little private ceremony? I said, no, really, this needs to be public. You really need to. And I want you to invite your family. And he's like, oh, I'm not inviting my family. We're all fighting. Everybody's fighting. I said, invite them anyway. So his family showed up, all right, his whole family. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name names right now because you know these people, all right? Stephen Sandra Mullins came, and Stephen Sandra Mullins at the time were divorced from one another. But they showed up anyway to support Sandra's brother, and his parents came along, and, you know, Stephen Sandra's kids came along, and they stayed. They kept coming. And sooner or later, Steve was a little curious about what I was doing with Jim, and so he wanted to come to the discipleship stuff too. He came, and he got saved, and Steve and Sandra remarried. You just never know when we celebrate life change in people you never know. And so we're, we're setting up to do that all year round. Here's the deal. We want to give you the opportunity to be a part of that. So for the month of August, it's going to be a fundraiser. Uh, we're going to have something set aside, separate out there, a little thermometer, keep in gauge of it, uh, for raising money to purchase this thing. So that will be happening the whole month of August. I hope you'll partner with that. Uh, we're really excited about the opportunity. Incidentally, if you have never been baptized as a believer. Maybe you were baptized younger and you don't remember it and you want to do that again or you've never been baptized as a new believer in Christ and you'd like to do that. Please indicate on that, on that card there, I would like to be baptized and we'll make sure we get in touch with you. Make sure your contact information's on there so we can get a hold of you 
but we'd love to add you to the list of people. Uh, the list is growing, and so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, other than that, there are uh, things for you to address in the bulletin. Please do that. Kids, come on up. It's the time for your worship time together. All right, so as the kids, what is this? Oh, okay, so Ellie forgot the box. So what we like to do normally is we like to send a box home with one of these kids, and they are supposed to put an item inside the box, and I am supposed to open this box for the first time today and then somehow relate this item to a message about God. But Ellie said she forgot the box, so she gave me this. Okay. What is this? It's a name tag. You put it on so people will know your name. Oh, you put it on so you will know your name, right? For what? So then people can know your name. Oh, so people can know your name. Okay. Well, who gives you guys your name? Our parents. Parents. Hmm. God. God. Okay. What does what does it mean to have a name? Does anybody know? This is I know that's a strange, deep theological. I mean, like philosophical question. You need it for your class. What you need it for your class? Yeah, you do, right? What does a name do? What does your name do? It helps people people know because if you didn't have a name, then what would they call you? Right. Yeah. So everybody, most of us here have a first name, right? Everybody's got a first name, right? Raise your hand if you got a first name. Who has a middle name or more than one middle name? And how many of you have a last name? Right, everybody, right? What's the purpose of that last name? What does that do? What does your last name do? You're going to keep going. It's for your family groups. Ah, it identifies you as to what family you are a part of. Okay, it identifies you as to what family you are a part of. That right there makes me think of the names that God has given us, okay? God has given us each a name. God writes our names inside of this awesome book. It's called the Book of Life, right? And inside that Book of Life is all of the names of the people who have accepted Jesus Christ. That book is full of all of those people. And God, God writes those people down in there. That right there, that name, and with that, he gives you Jesus Christ as your identity. And Jesus Christ becomes your family, and that is how you are identified as part of God's family. You take on the name of Jesus' of, of his death on the cross. You take on Jesus' name in behalf, on behalf of your, uh, your name that is guilty. I know I kind of stumbled through that a little bit, but I want you guys to think about when you see a name, you think about your name, I want you to think of how you can be identified in, into God's family as taken on Jesus' name. Okay, that's my hope for you guys. Ellie, you better put that up so people know who you are. All right. I'll go ahead and pray for you, and then hopefully we'll get the box for next week. Father God, thank you so much for this beautiful day. I want to thank you so much for each one of these kids, and I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to be able to walk alongside of their parents and to teach these kids about you and your love and, and what you've done for them. Um, Father, I just pray that in light of all of those things, that they understand that there's a responsibility on their end to repent and obey you. And Father, I just pray that as they learn what repentance looks like, that they, they act it out daily. And that they choose to follow you so that ultimately their name can be written down in your book. And that they may experience life. Father, I pray that you bless their time, bless their teachers. Um, and just help them to learn something new about you today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as they're heading off to their class, let's take some time and talk to the Lord, shall we? Father, your word tells us that you gave your son Jesus the name above all names, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And yet in your mercy, in your grace, 
You chose to forgive us of our sin. And you opened the door for us to be adopted into your family. Scripture says that we become your your child, that we become co-heirs with Christ. That is just hard to, to wrap our minds around. And yet we believe your word, we trust your word. And so, Lord, today we assemble here together as your church to worship you, to worship a God of grace and of mercy and of forgiveness, a God who gives us new life. Father, I thank you and I praise you for that. I thank you for each and every person in this room who has experienced that change personally, who could stand really and probably fill our time together today just testifying to what you've done in their life. I pray, Lord, that you will use each and every one of us to encourage others who are maybe struggling in their their walk with you or just struggling with day-to-day life or people who don't know you, who are searching, who are looking for something that they really can't quite identify what it is. And I pray, Lord, that we're just willing to have those conversations with them. Thank you for uh, Marlon Ream yesterday being willing to teach us uh, how to have some of those conversations. And I pray, Father, that uh, we will be a church that will continue to uh, man, fan the flames of our desire to come alongside of people and to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, I want to thank you for uh, walking alongside of Craig Cloveter. Excited that he's here today. Uh, certainly has been through the ringer as of late and uh, still has things coming up too. So, Lord, we pray that uh, you continue to guide that process, work with doctors, um, give them great wisdom and insight as to uh, what's going on there and be able to begin treating that. For others, Lord, maybe uh, who are back today who we haven't been able to see for a while for a whole variety of reasons, just grateful to see our family again. There's others out there, Lord, who are still traveling around and here and there. And so, Lord, I pray that you watch over them wherever they are. I pray that you bring them back to us safely. Lord, I would ask, Father, that you continue to uh, help us, Lord, to have insight, your insight, as to exactly what it is that you would like us to focus on as a church. As we're preparing, Lord, to go through a time of fasting and prayer, I pray, Lord, that you will uh, help each of us to examine very closely that which we could uh, give up, that we could sacrifice, uh, and, and to use that time to focus on you. Lord, teach us during this time, and I would pray that you would unite us during this time. Give us one mind and one purpose. That's what you call your church to do. And so, Lord, we come together to worship you. We do it in song. In a little while, we're going to open up your word. And right now, we just want to do it, Lord, by giving back to you a portion of that which you've allowed us to earn. Father, I pray that as we give, we do so cheerfully, generously, as you call us to do in Scripture. And I pray, Father, that you continue to Uh, provide, that you continue to uh, give us clarity as to how you want us to use the resources that you provide. It's all about you, so we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We will receive the offering at this time. Uh, Remember, please put that communication card in the basket when it comes by. All right, let's stand to our feet and continue on in our worship through singing. I'd like to teach you a new song today. Um, I don't know if you've noticed it. We, we try to do this whenever we introduce a new song. Uh, we'll send you something in email with that song so you can get familiar with it before you even show up. So hopefully you're taking advantage of that. But we're going to go through today. I'm going to teach you the chorus, and then we'll, we'll go through this chorus a couple of times. And then uh, 
We'll just keep right on singing.
steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faith. God. You are a holy God. You are a God of justice and a God of mercy. So today, Lord, we just acknowledge that in our praise, and Lord, we again lift it all up to you because you alone are worthy of it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. So I'll let you know right up front, today's message and next week's message really is piggybacking on what we talked about last week. Now, if you weren't here last week or you didn't get a chance to listen to it online, I would really encourage you to go back, find that message online, and uh, connect with what we're talking about here. These will stand on their own, but it will help make a little more sense to you uh, in light of the context of what we talked about last week. Uh, I'm sure you're aware by now of the turmoil in our community over the last month or so uh, in regards to the Teen Health Center. And no matter where you stand on the issue, with our limited knowledge, our limited understanding, no one can argue that this event has shined a light on the fact that there's an increasing divide over morals that's been plaguing our community and our culture for some time now. Last week, we spoke about how the constant bombardment of this worldview is creeping into the churches, and we were all admonished to hold the line on this issue. But holding the line comes with a cost. Jesus says in Luke 14, if you do not carry your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But he also warns, don't begin until you count the cost. Paul writes in 2 Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's not an if, not a maybe. If you and I choose to hold the line of biblical truth, we will be opening ourselves up to attack. It's just truth. During the recent battle that's been taking place in the school district here, a member of our church, and by association, Christians in general, had been labeled as haters by members of the LGBTQ community. You know, years ago, the Alliance for Defending Freedom made it known that states out west were moving towards putting into law uh, that if you opened your facilities for, like, heterosexual weddings, then through the Public Accommodations Act, you would also have to open up your facilities for homosexual couples, regardless of what your beliefs are. It's happening out west. And so the encouragement from them was to make a statement on marriage and sexuality, put it into your bylaws, and the reason they wanted you to put it into your bylaws was that would make it official, and they wanted you to do it before 
someone approached you with the request for the facilities. Because if you waited until afterwards, then it would look like you were picking and choosing and discriminating in that regard. But if you do it ahead of time, it gives you legal standing. And that's exactly what we did. We went ahead and made that statement. And it's currently in our bylaws. But in response to the increased attention that has been received with the teen health care, particularly the mural, this former member of our church, or a former member of our church, felt compelled to pull out our statement on marriage and sexuality and make it public. And the reason they did it was because they wanted to embarrass the member that goes to our church. They wanted to try to embarrass this church and wanted to label us as haters. In fact, we were told by that same former member when we were creating that document that we were doing it out of fear. Those are some pretty ugly words, hate and fear. They make us sound vindictive and weak, and I think that's the point. And nobody wants to have those kind of words attached to them. The counter-argument from the LGBTQ camp, of course, can be loosely supported in Scripture, comes out of 1 John chapter 4. It says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, they're right. They acknowledged correctly that God is love. But by love, they mean acceptance. And thereby, we get the term inclusive. It's a subtle twist of what it means to love. And it's central to their ideology that separates one side from the other on this issue. Scripture says that God loves everyone. Therefore, the misapplied leap here is that he accepts everyone just the way that they are. And anyone who claims to be a child of God and does not accept people just the way that they are is going against God and their haters. Now, that all sounds pretty bad. And it's understandable by one, why nobody would want to have that attached to them. But, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Is it really true? that the Bible teaches that we aren't supposed to live in hate and fear ever? You know, I think in this climate of political correctness that we live in here today, the church has given up too much ground in that direction to the point where the truth is starting to get swallowed up in it. Not only do I believe that hate and fear are biblical, but I want to spend the next couple of weeks teaching us how to do it, how to live in it. Today's passage comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And it will also be up on a screen. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8 of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, by the way, is written by a man named Solomon, who Scripture declares is the wisest man who ever lived and who will ever live since. Ecclesiastes 3, we're going to read the entire passage of verses 1 through 8 here. Often you hear these things maybe at, at funerals and things too. Heard one yesterday at a funeral, same thing. For everything, there is a season. A time for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to harvest. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to cry and a time to laugh. A time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to turn away. 
A time to search and a time to quit searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. It's time for everything. Kind of breaks it down for us. Clearly, though, according to Scripture, our God of love says that there is a time to hate. There's a time to hate. Well, if God is love and he's supposed to be our example and he says that there's a time to hate, it would be good for us to ask a few questions. Like, does God ever hate? Are his followers supposed to hate? And what do we do when people hate us? Well, God's nature, his very nature is love. And what we know about God is he can't go against his nature. God is going to love. And he's always going to do what's best for others because that's what love does. And he hates what is contrary to his nature. He hates what is done that is not done for the best of others. He hates that which harms others rather than protecting them and building them up. So yes, the God who is love does hate. What does he hate? First thing we see right out of the gate is he hates evil. He hates evil. Proverbs chapter 6 says there are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things that he detests. Notice, hates and detests are synonymous with one another. What are they? Haughty eyes, that's somebody who arrogantly thinks they're superior to other people. A lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent. A heart that plots evil. Feet that race to do wrong. A false witness who pours out lies. A person who sows discord in a family. He hates evil. Second thing he hates is deception. Proverbs chapter 8 says, I speak the truth and I detest, there it is, every kind of deception. What kind of deception? Every kind. It comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes and forms. It's not always spoken. Third thing he hates is sin. James chapter 1 says temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Sin gives birth to death. God hates it. And all three of these things are connected. And all three of these things encompass all of the things that God hates. The things that God hates could fall in one of these categories here. And it would be wrong for you and I to apply the, this solely to the sins of the LGBTQ community. That'd be wrong. Why? Because Scripture tells us in Romans 3, everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Shame on us if we look at somebody else's sin and think it's worse than ours. We sin because we've been deceived, and we are deceived because of the presence of evil. And God hates evil. Now, looking at the other side of that equation, there's that notion that God's love means equal, means being the same as acceptance. Acceptance and love are not the same thing. Neither is rejection and hate. They're not the same thing. See, the culture wants to spin it that way, but that doesn't make it so. Accepting someone's sinful lifestyle. Now, let me clarify what I mean by that. When I say accepting, I'm not, resign, I'm not saying resigning ourselves to the fact that it's so. Not that kind of accepting. 
I'm saying where we support in any kind of form or fashion. When we accept someone's sinful lifestyle, it is not loving them. Nor is rejecting their sinful lifestyle hating them. No matter what the sin is. Let me give you an example. We read in Scripture about this encounter that Jesus has with this woman who was caught in adultery. And he tells her something real simple. He goes, well, go get your husband. And then she kind of makes this comment about, well, you know, her husband. She kind of like awkward talking about her husband. And he goes, you know what, you're right. This is not your husband. In fact, the man you're living with right now is not your husband. In fact, you've had five different husbands. But he followed up his conversation with her with this statement. Go and sin no more. See, he didn't ignore her current lifestyle. He didn't ignore that that was a sin. He didn't excuse it, nor did he turn a blind eye to it. And he certainly did not accept it. Instead, he exposed it, he forgave it, and then he called for repentance from it. God clearly tells us he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. See, God's God's acceptance is based on Man's repentance. If we want God to accept us, we have to repent from our sin. His love, on the other hand, is based on his nature. God can certainly love, because that's his nature, and still not accept at the same time. We see that all throughout Scripture, don't we? Look at the nation of Israel. God loved the nation of Israel, but he didn't accept their rebellion. He didn't accept their idol worship. He didn't accept some of their horrendous temple worship that they were getting connected with. He rejected all that. Love and acceptance are not the same thing. Rejection and hate is not the same thing either. So let's take that just a little bit further and see if we can't make us a little more uncomfortable. God can both love and hate people. Let that sink in a minute. Because you've probably always been led to believe, you know, our favorite phrase, right? Hate the sin, love the sinner. God wouldn't hate people. He loves people. Scripture says he loves everyone. It's hard to accept that. So I just want you to hang in there for a minute. Let's go back to our Proverbs 6 passage a minute that we looked at earlier. There are six things that the Lord hates. No, seven things that he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who sows discord in a family. Notice, he doesn't just mention the things that he hates, but he also includes people as well. Haughty eyes, tongues, hands, the heart, the feet, the false witness, and the one who sows discord in a family. All people. Psalm 5 says, The proud may not stand in your presence, for you hate all who do evil. All who do evil. See, guys, sin cannot be separated from the sinner in God's eyes. Except, except by the forgiveness available in Christ alone. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 1 that we were once far away from God. 
you were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he's reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he's brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That's good news. See, because we were all on the receiving end of God's hate. We were his enemies. But Christ, and Christ alone, opened that door for our forgiveness, for his love to just pour out his, and, and to be lavished on us, for him to adopt us as his children. When we repent, and there's that word, man, we got to repent of our sins. When we do, our sins are forgiven because Jesus paid the price for them on the cross. You know, I was trying to figure out some kind of an analogy, and, and I don't think I'd come up with a good one, so I'm going to fumble through this here. But if you can picture somebody, uh, okay, I'm just going to really step out on a crazy limb here. All right, let's say I show up at the golf course and I find out that some guy paid $500 to cover X amount of people's, you know, green fees out there. So I walk in and, you know, hey, man, it's paid for. I have a choice. I can either say, cool, thank you, grab my stuff and I'm going golfing. Or I can reject it and I say, nope, don't want it. Just because it's paid for doesn't mean it's yours. It's not yours till you receive it, till you accept it. And you can only do that by repenting of your sins. You can't continue to live in your sin and ignore your sin and try to make light of your sin and try to think that God is going to accommodate your sin. You can't do that and be accepted. But man, when we accept it, we're told in Colossians chapter 2 that he canceled the record of charges against us and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. His payment for our sins separates us from our sins in God's eyes forever when we accept it. We're no longer recognized in God's eyes according to our sin. He recognizes us according to Christ's righteousness because of his grace. You know, God is the only one who is capable of righteous love and righteous hate at the same time. Because our sin is an offense against his righteous character, and his righteous standards. We aren't capable of that same kind of level of love and hate. Jesus says you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. Jesus follows it up and says, yes, I am the gate. Those who come through me will be saved. Folks, get this. Please get this. All are invited, but not all will repent. Therefore, not all will be accepted. This isn't an all dogs go to heaven kind of a thing. Okay, it's not. You, by being a good person and treating people nice and doing nice things for people and all this kind of stuff, that is not going to get you accepted by God. He's happy with that, but that's not what gets you accepted by God. Only repenting of our sins, accepting the gift that he gave us through Jesus Christ is the only way that we can be made right with God, period. God hates the evil that deceives a person into sin that keeps them apart from him. And in the same way that God hates, we are to hate. So what are we supposed to hate? 
Well, we read this last week in Jude, verse 23, right? The sins that contaminate their lives. Paul says in Romans 12, very interesting verse here, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. You know, the NASB version of that says, love without hypocrisy. Love without hypocrisy. And it goes on to explain. Hate what is evil, love what is good. That's loving without hypocrisy. But if you love evil, right? Our verse that we read last week. Woe to those who say that good is evil and evil is good. If you try to make evil good, watch out. You're, you're hypocritical in your love. You say you're loving somebody, but you're accepting the sinful behavior. You're a hypocrite, according to God. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love and honor one another above yourselves. If you're not willing to do that, your love is hypocrisy. It's fake. See, the idea here is if our love is authentic, we will be devoted to the welfare of those we love above our own. And part of that welfare is hating, you ready for this? Three things. Evil (laughs) that allows for deception that leads to sin in people's lives. Evil that allows for deception that leads to sin in their lives. And instead, we're supposed to cling to what is good. See, compromising your hate for the evil that's deceived your loved one into sinning against God, hear me, okay? If you are just going to compromise your hate for evil that has deceived your loved one into sinning that is keeping them away from God just to keep peace in your relationship, you're not loving them. No matter how our culture spins it. That's one of the lies that God hates. The writer in Proverbs says, all who fear the Lord will hate evil. Not evil people. Right? We, we've got to back up the bus there. Because you and I, right, unlike God, you and I are not able to hate the sinner because we're one of them. We're no better than the next person. The sins of others is not an offense against our character. It's not an offense against our standards. But we can hate what that is doing to them now and for all of eternity. We've got to understand that hating people shows contempt for God. How do you figure? John writes, if someone says that I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he's not seen. See, not only does God command us to love people, but we need to remember that people are image bearers of God. We're all image bearers of God. If we hate people, we are showing hatred for God. It's hard to separate the person from the sin. I get it. It's hard to remember in the moment that they are a person who is held captive. I get it. But if we show hatred towards them, we're showing hatred towards God. You know, the irony of that is when we show authentic love for people, as we've been talking about what authentic love is, 
when we show this kind of authentic love for people, particularly by hating that which contaminates their lives, they in turn hate us for it. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you've reached out to somebody in love, shared your concern with them, poured your heart out to them, and they deemed you a hater, and they've turned their back on you. We've been promised that. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, all the nations will hate you because you are my followers. They just will. That doesn't feel good. So what do we do when people hate us? Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, what blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man? When that happens, be happy. Yes, leap for joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. What are we supposed to do when people hate us because we show authentic love for them? We're supposed to celebrate. Yeah, right. I mean, it's got to be the most unnatural response ever. This called for response to, to be happy has nothing to do with how their actions make you feel. We aren't called to celebrate because they made us feel good. We're called to love people, to endure the harsh treatment from people because that'll be proof. The harsh treatment that we receive from people will be the proof that we are genuinely Christ's followers. And he's telling us to endure these things, and he's saying that if we will, there are great rewards in heaven. Now, I know that's hard for us to think about, right? I mean, trying to think about things in the future, it's not really a good motivator, nor is it really a whole lot of consolation. Because we're temporary-minded. We, we think about the here and now, what we can see, what we can experience, what we can touch, what we can feel. Right? That's what we tend to think about. We think about somebody coming at us. And what hits us? Well, we have rights. We have self-respect. We have pride. Nobody's going to treat me that way and get away with it. But Jesus is trying to tell us, if you're truly one of my followers... Yes, they will. And you and I are to celebrate it. I think about the disciples who were ministering for the Lord and preaching, teaching on the streets, and they were told to stop it. They wouldn't stop it. They were hauled in, and they were flogged for it. They were beaten for it. And they get out of there, and they're all like, woo man, they considered it like we were considered worthy to suffer for Jesus, right? They understood this. Now, that might taste funny for you, uh, maybe for a while, maybe this rest of this week as you're thinking about that idea, you'd be like, man, that, that just is hard to swallow. Well, to go further, Jesus says in Luke 6, to you who are willing to listen, so if that's you, please listen. I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. And he gives us the reasoning. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. Love your enemies. Do good to them. So let's fill in the blank, shall we? Love them. Love them. Care more about the welfare of that person than you do the relationship with that person. You following that? You, because you react 
authentically in love, it may cause a split in your relationship. But do you love God enough to love that person enough to share with them lovingly the truth, even if it severs your relationship? Love them authentically, not hypocritically. Serve them. Jesus says that when we take care of others, when we serve others, we're actually doing it to him. Right? You remember that whole thing in Scripture? When did I ever see you in prison? When did I ever see you hungry? When did I ever see you naked? When did I ever see that? Whenever you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Bless them. See, Jesus tells us not to return evil for evil. That's the natural. That's what we normally do, right? Rather than retaliate against someone's curses on you and returning fire, offer words of kindness and encouragement. Right now, that feels like it's a message for you and not for me because that's hard. Everything in my being, when somebody wants to come at me, is to let them know that he won't get away with that with me. And the last thing on my mind is words of encouragement and kindness. Finally, he says, pray for them. Rather than getting caught up in the whole flesh and blood kind of battle, realize that the attacks that are coming from other people is the result of the attacks that's coming on them. And turn that into a reason to pray for them. Again, look, I am not saying that any of this is easy. Jesus never said it would be. But this is what you and I signed up for when we entered into a covenant relationship with him. That's why he tells us to count the cost before doing so. See, when you enter into a covenant relationship with God, it's no longer about me and mine. It's about he and his. You don't get to automatically react in the natural and have it excused Because as a follower of Christ, we are supposed to sacrifice our own wants, our own needs, and act in the supernatural. We're supposed to act through the power of Christ. Let me tell you something. You stand in the face of somebody hurling curses at you, and you return with encouragement and kindness, you're going to blow their minds. We... As followers of Jesus, as children of God, we must hate what God hates, even when that unleashes hatred towards us. And I would say especially when that unleashes hatred towards us. we got to do that in order to love with an authentic love. Don't allow the culture's misleading uh, of that label to cause you to shrink back in shame. They hurl you with a hater. They hurl you with fearful. You now know, yep, I'm a hater. But I'm a hater of what is hurting you. You know, I have to admit, when I I teach this, I do so with fear and trembling. Because somehow somebody's going to take it and they're going to misuse it to validate displaying self-righteous, un-Christ-like attitudes and speech and behavior towards those who are living in sins that offend us. Jesus is our example of how to balance hatred for sin and love for the sinner. Follow his example and live in hate appropriately and unapologetically. Let's pray.
Lord, on some level, we can we can look at how sin affects our family members, and we can get really angry at that which is harming them. That seems to be easy. But there's a lot of other things in life because we act in the flesh and blood. We have a hard time seeing things in the spirit realm. We have a hard time of understanding that that people react the way that they do because they are being attacked by the enemy too, that they are under fire, that they are being held captive. And Lord, may we hate that which is holding them captive. May we hate that which is causing them to be deceived and leading them into sin that separates them from you. May we be authentic in our love for people, not confusing acceptance for love, not accepting rejection as hate, but holding the line, staying firm, loving authentically because we want to see people come out of captivity and to experience freedom in Christ. Help us to do that. Forgive us where we blow it. But help us to keep on keeping on for your name's sake. Pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand together as we close. <clears throat> no one, no one can love like Jesus. He is jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. I am.
we're never really going to understand the depth of God's love and his grace until we can come to terms with the depths of God's hatred for evil and for sin, deception. Because only then can we really look into our own lives and see how that's really messed us up, how that has separated us from God. And then we can really appreciate the depth of God's love to show us that grace, to show us that forgiveness, to allow us to become part of his family. And when we grasp that, oh, the love of God is amazing. And that's what we want people to hear. We want people to see. May they see it in us first. Go in peace. May the God of love and peace go with you now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week.